Excelente. Um, all right. Well, without further ado, the two videos I wanted to watch the other day, I think they're going to work for us great today. So we're going to start off watching. We'll watch one video, make a little comment, watch another video, and then I want to wrap up this chapter. We're going to talk about something that you might not be too familiar with. And it's in a way, it's interesting that it comes up in the ethics, uh, business ethics class, but it's talking about different ways to um, engage employees using financial methods. So we've talked about all different other character-based things and um, ways to encourage teamwork and, and people uh, having a, an attachment to work because of the quality of the leadership and things like this. But today we're going to talk about um, group-based financial incentives. Some of these I've experienced myself. Some of them um, I've never heard of anyone actually using this. So it's not that it's not popular. It just means I just haven't experienced it. So we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. Anyone have any questions before we get rolling here? All right. Let's see if we can get this working today for a change. There we go. And can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Great. All right. Let's see if we can get this uh, video to pull up here. Don't make a liar out of me. Come on. There we go. Okay. I have a good feeling about this, everybody. I have a really good feeling about this. American Airlines, I'm on a three-hour flight. One flight attendant's positive, motivated, upbeat, enthusiastic. One is negative, bitter, angry, and cynical. Same plane, same pay, same employee engagement program. What's the difference? It's not the outside, it's the inside. People are missing part of the equation of employee engagement. I'm doing some exciting new research now. What we have been doing is getting people to evaluate themselves on six questions. And I'll go through each of the six. The first question is, and every question starts with, did I do my best to? Which is, by the way, the one thing in life you can control. And then I'm going to compare these six questions with what is normally asked in employee engagement. The first of the six questions is, did I do my best to set clear goals? So rather than saying, did the company set clear goals for me, did I do my best to set clear goals for myself? Number two, did I do my best to make progress toward goal achievement? Rather than saying, did the company help me achieve my goals? Did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my own goals? Number three, back to the question about optimism, did I do my best to be happy? Rather than saying, did somebody make me happy? Did I do my best to be happy myself? Number four, did I do my best to find meaning? Rather than saying, did somebody make my work meaningful? Did I do my best to make my work meaningful myself? Number five, did I do my best to build positive relationships? Rather than that classic question of, do you have a best friend at work? Were you doing your best to build positive relationships with the people around you? And then finally, number six, did I do my best to be fully engaged? Now, we've done 79 studies so far, 2,537 responses. The numbers are amazing. 37% of the people that do this for two weeks say, I feel better at everything. Happier, more meaningful, really? better goals, 37%. Uh, over 60% said I got better at four out of six. 89% said I got better at something, 10.5% say it stayed the same, 0.5% get worse. Almost nobody. Why? It gets us to focus on the one thing I can control. Did I do my best? All right. I'm going to stop the share now for a second. Okay. Everyone can hear that fine. So hopefully you kind of picked up, we're back in the vein of what we've been talking about, which is employee engagement and we've been looking at it from the leader's perspective how can i as a leader make an environment in the workplace that's going to help my employees feel appreciated and meaningful and they they're clearly communicated with and all of that this video spun it around and said well you know there is some responsibility on the employee's part as well 
So how many of you, by raise of hands, have had a job that you just really didn't like? For one reason or another, you worked somewhere that you really didn't like. Okay, so I've had a couple of those. And um, sometimes it was one that it was relationship oriented. Sometimes it was the work itself. The people weren't that bad, but the work was really just not very fulfilling. Some of it was just the overall environment. Um, but if you were to start off, and I'd encourage you to kind of take something from his playbook here, asking yourself first. So you cannot expect that any job or any boss is going to fulfill you, right? So you you can't put that on another person. It has to start with you as far as being an employee. You have a responsibility to uh, set goals. You have a responsibility to make progress. You have a responsibility to find joy and meaning in what you're doing. Um, you have a responsibility to build relationships and you have a responsibility to be engaged. So this takes the ownership back on you as the employee, not just always looking for um, someone to blame when things aren't perfect, right? Now, there might be a job or a coworker or a, a, a boss that you just can't work with and things are going to have to change. But I think if you start looking at yourself first, before you start placing blame on others, you'll probably have a, a much better result in wherever it is God places you. You know that God can put you in a terrible job, right? So um, just because the job isn't what you hoped it would be, does it mean it's not God's will for you to be there? I mean, that's, that's a, it's a tough question when you're in the middle of one of those kind of jobs, when really you would literally like to just walk away and, and you don't care what it would cost, you're just done. But could God put you in a job that's less than desirable for you? Yes. So how do you make it through that job? I think I shared with you guys that I was a prison guard for a while. And um, while I was in the Air Force, we had our where I was stationed at Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, was a sister base to Lackland Air Force Base. So there was a golf course between our two bases. And then it was really like one giant base. Well, Kelly Air Force Base did not have a jail, but Lackland did. It was called the Consolidated Confinement Facility, the CCF, I think it was called. So the deal was if someone from Kelly Air Force Base got in trouble and had to go to jail while they were awaiting their trial or their punishment, their, their actual punishment was at the jail, someone from their unit would have to also go to be what they call an augmentee, basically almost like a, a part-time prison guard because there weren't enough prison guards at the prison to uh, staff a prison for two bases. They just had a, enough of a prison for one. So if you sent someone or if the judge sent someone, then you had to send a prison guard. So I was getting out of the Air Force six months later and they knew that. So a lot of times they would send guys or ladies that didn't have much more time in the unit anyway. So they sent me. So I was a prison guard for, I think, six to eight weeks. I got there. First thing I hated about the job. So I'll tell you all the things I didn't like about it. I had to get up at 4.30 every day. Now, when I was your guys' age, when I was in my early 20s, getting up early was worse than getting a cavity filled. Getting up early was worse than um, uh, having to run 10 miles. I literally would make myself sick thinking about having to get up at 4.30 in the morning. It was so terrible. I just hated it. So some of you, maybe you're morning people and you can't relate to that. But me, I just hated it. So then when I got a job that made me get up at 4 to be there by 4.30 or whatever, it was just the worst. So that was day one. I already had a, a terrible attitude about it. Then I get there and the people I'm with all day are all criminals. So my job was to take the criminals out to do their, they would do like lawn, lawn work and painting and cleaning and stuff all over the base. And um, they would have to go to the cafeteria to eat. And so basically I was babysitting criminals all day long. It kind of got me ready for teaching this class, actually. 
just kidding. Um, so uh, I, I, so the people I'm with all day, some of these people were really rough. Then when I got back to the, the jail itself, I'd have to sit in a, um, a guard cell. It was like just a little office with glass all around it about the size of my desk with at least one other prison guard that had been there for years. And these guys were really rough. Matter of fact, over time, I came to like the prisoners more than the prison guards. The prisoners were nicer. I mean, maybe they were just trying to be nice to get something, but the guards were just rough. It was terrible. So, and it was the last place on Lackland Air Force Base that you could smoke inside because the prison guards couldn't get their mandated smoke break so they could smoke in the little office so i had to sit two feet away from someone puffing on cigarettes all day and it was just terrible the prisoners i had i had one of my duties was to take um this one gentleman out because of his rank he didn't have to go and do the chores that everyone else had to do he was able to just stay in his room and they actually brought in cable tv for him he had an air-conditioned cell unlike everybody else uh, because of his rank, but he had uh, killed his wife. So I had to take him out on, I had to put him in shackles, leg shackles, arm shackles, chain that goes between the two around his waist, take him out so he could take his smoke break and then sit there with him for 15 minutes twice a day. So I am now babysitting someone that admittedly had killed his wife and I'm hanging out with him. The whole thing was just, it was almost like if you could have designed the opposite of my favorite type of job, that's exactly what I did. And I hated it. For the first couple of days, I just really, my attitude was terrible. I was grouchy. The only thing that was good is because you're going in so early, I got off at like 2.30 every day or whatever, but I was so tired and grouchy, I didn't, didn't enjoy it. So what ended up happening was uh, I got convicted about it because I'm like, boy, what an opportunity. I'm here. I can't get out of it. So maybe I just need to kind of put my whole heart into it. And it changed the way I looked at the job itself. It changed the way I looked at my coworkers. changed the way I looked at these prisoners. And eventually the Lord allowed me to do a Bible study with the prisoners um, at, the, at the jail for those six weeks. It was really amazing because these men and women couldn't go to the chapel services. And most of them, a chaplain wouldn't come visit them. And some of them, their, their criminal behavior was kind of petty compared to others. But uh, yeah, so it really had to come back to me. I was looking for the job to satisfy me, the environment to be satisfying, the work to be meaningful. But I had to kind of come back and do a real gut check and I got convicted about that. So God can put you in a job that you just totally don't like. It happens all the time. And sometimes it's exactly where you're supposed to be. So then you got to go back and ask yourself, am I setting my own clear goals? Am I progressing? Am I finding ways to be joyful, have meaningful work? Am I building positive relationships? Am I fully engaged? You can sabotage something if you don't like it. And you could blame the job and say, well, see, I knew it wasn't going to go well. But down deep in your heart, you know that you've pretty much contributed to it. It's self-destructing. So... You don't want to become a self-fulfilling prophecy in that situation. All right. Any comments on that? Have you ever had a paper route? No. Oh, that's my second least favorite job. Getting up our paper route. We had to get up at 2 in the morning to go wrap papers, deliver them from 4 to 6 a.m. Oh, the worst day of that was... Uh, we delivered the Sunday paper, and a lot of times Sunday paper, of course, is huge. And then they would put these inserts in the Sunday paper, and sometimes they were like samples of things. So when it was a sample of like, you know, gum, that was that made the whole van smell like mint. Well, one day they did Irish Spring soap as a sample inside the paper. So the vehicle smelled like this sickening, soapy, eye-watering scent. And the guy that got me to do the paper route for him, he was on a missions trip for a couple of weeks. So I took it for him. I ended up losing money because I had to pay helpers. So he's like, oh, this is great. You're, you're a Bible college student. You'll make plenty of money. I lost money. It cost me money to do it. So I was getting up at 2 a.m. seven days a week, and I was losing money. And uh, so my two helpers that day, my brother-in-law and his friend, 
both got so nauseous, I had to keep pulling over so they could get out of the car and be car sick and then get back in the car. So it was just terrible. And I paid them to do that all morning too. So it was just, anyway, story time with Uncle Jared. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to a little more uh, of this PowerPoint here. I want to go on this video. Okay, this this one is a, just a short video about engagement and productivity. And this this is a, a this guy's got a couple of really good TED talks out there. But um, hopefully you can kind of understand through his accent. He's got a pretty thick accent, but it is very entertaining. We'll talk about this after. Paul Krugman, the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, once wrote, productivity is not everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. So this is serious. You know, there are not that many things on earth that are almost everything. Productivity is the principal driver of the prosperity of a society. So we have a problem. In the largest European economies, productivity used to grow 5% per annum in the 50s, 60s, early 70s. From 73 to 83, 3% per annum. From 83 to 95, 2% per annum. Since 1995, less than 1% per annum. The same profile in Japan. The same profile in the US despite a momentary rebound 15 years ago. And despite all the technological innovations around us, the internet, the information, the new information and communication technologies, you know, when productivity grows 3% per annum, you double the standards of living every generation. Every generation is twice as well off as its parents. When it grows one person per annum, it takes three generations to double the standards of living. And in this process, many people will be less well off than their parents. They will have less of everything, smaller roofs, or perhaps no roof at all, less access to education, to vitamins, to antibiotics, to vaccination, to everything. Think of all the problems that we are facing at the moment. All. Chances are that they are rooted in the productivity crisis. Why this crisis? Because the basic tenets about efficiency, effectiveness in organizations, in management, have become counterproductive for human efforts. Everywhere, in public services, in companies, in the way we work, the way we innovate, invest, try to learn to work better. Take the holy trinity of efficiency. Clarity, measurement, accountability. They make human efforts derail. There are two ways to look at it, to prove it. One, the one I prefer, is rigorous, elegant, nice, math. But the full math version takes a little while. So there is another one. It is to look at a relay race. This is what we will do today. It's a bit more animated, more visual, and also faster. It's a race. So hopefully it's faster. <laughs> World Championship final. Women, eight teams in the final. The fastest team is the US team. They have the fastest women on earth. They are the favorite team to win. Notably, if you compare them to an average team, say the French team, <laughs> based on their best performance in the 100-meter race, 
if you add the individual times of the US runners, they arrive at the finish line 3.2 meters ahead of the French team. And this year, the US team is in great shape. Based on their best performance this year, they arrive 6.4 meters ahead of the French team, based on the data. We are going to look at the race. At some point, you will see towards the end that Tori Edwards, the US runner, the fourth US runner, is ahead. Not surprising. This year, she got the gold medal in the 100 meter race. And by the way, Christy Gaines, the second runner in the US team, is the fastest woman on earth. So there are 3.2, sorry, 3.5 billion women on earth. Where are the two fastest in the US team? And the two other runners in the US team are not bad either. Huh? <laughs> So clearly, the US team has won the war for talents. But behind, the average team is trying to catch up. Let's watch the race. Ouais. Voilà, c'est parti, Patricia Girard pour l'équipe de France. Patricia qui va aller chercher Muriel Urtis. Elle est partie comme une folle, Patricia. Allez, allez, attention, on va laisser Cassiou et c'est passé. Muriel Urtis dans la ligne opposée contre les états unis avec Kirsty Gaines. Muriel dans la ligne opposée qui fait l'effort, qui revient. Allez, c'est super, Muriel, faut passer à Sylvia. Oui, ça passe. Sylvia aussi. Allez, Sylvia dans le relais. Sylvia dans le virage. Sylvia de Félix, euh, Sylvia de Félix qui se bat. Qui va chercher Christine avec Christine. Avec Christine Aron. Allez, 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 Christine Aron. Contre les États-Unis, ça va être super. Ouais, 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 allez, ouais, allez, ouais, allez, ouais, allez, 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 ça va passer. Elle est sont championne du monde. Championne du monde. So what happened? The fastest team did not win. The slower one did. By the way, I hope you appreciate the deep historical search I did to make the French look good. Huh? <laughs> it's not, uh, but it's, let's not exaggerate, it's not archaeology either. Huh? Okay. So, but why? Because of cooperation. You know, when you hear this sentence, thanks to cooperation, the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts. This is not poetry. This is not philosophy. This is math. Those who carry the baton are slower, but their baton is faster. Miracle of cooperation. It multiplies energy, intelligence, in human efforts. It is the essence of human efforts. How we work together, how each effort contributes to the effort of others. With cooperation, we can do more with less. Now, what happens to cooperation when the holy grail, the holy trinity even, of clarity, measurement, accountability, appears. Clarity. You know, management reports are full of complaints about the lack of clarity. Compliance audits, consultants diagnostics. We need more clarity. We need to clarify the roles, the processes. It is as though the runners in the team were saying, let's be clear. Where does my role really start and end? Am I supposed to run for 95 meters, 96, 97, 90? It's important, let's be clear. If you say 97, after 97 meters, people will drop the baton whether there is somebody to take it or not. Accountability. We are constantly trying to put accountability in someone's hands. Who is accountable for this process? We need somebody accountable for this process. So in the relay race, since passing the baton is so important, then we need somebody clearly accountable for passing the baton. So between each runners, now we would have a new dedicated athlete, clearly dedicated to taking the baton from one runner and passing it to the next runner. And we would have at least two like that. Well, would we 
really in that case uh, win the race but that I don't know but for sure we would have a clear interface a clear line of accountability we will know who to blame but we will never win the race you know if you think about it we pay more attention on knowing who to blame in case we fail than in creating the conditions to succeed all the human intelligence put in organization design about structures processes systems what is the real goal to have somebody guilty in case they fail we are creating organizations able to fail but in a compliant way <laughs> with somebody clearly accountable when we fail and we are quite effective at that failing <laughs> measurement what gets measured gets done look to pass the baton you have to do it at the right time in the right hand at the right speed but to do that you have to put energy in your arm this energy that is in your arm will not be in your legs it will come at the expense of your measurable speed you have to shout early enough to the next runner when you will pass the baton to signal that you are arriving so that the next runner can prepare can anticipate and you have to shout loud because but the blood the, the energy that will be in your throat will not be in your legs because you know they are eight people shouting at the same time so you have to recognize the voice of your colleague you cannot say is it you <laughs> too late <laughs> huh? now let's look at the race in slow motion and concentrate on the third runner look at where she allocates her efforts her energy her attention not all in her legs that would be great for her own speed but also in her throat arm eye brain that make a difference in whose legs in the legs of the next runner but when the next runner runs super fast is it because she made a super effort or because of the way the third runner passed the baton there is no metric on earth that will give us the answer and if we reward people on the basis of their measurable performance they will put their energy their attention their blood in what can get measured in their legs and the baton will fall and slow down you know to cooperate is not a super effort it is how you allocate your effort it is to take a risk because you sacrifice the ultimate protection granted by objectively measurable individual performance to make a super difference in the performance of others with whom we are compared it takes to be stupid to cooperate then and people are not stupid they don't cooperate you know clarity accountability measurement were okay when the world was simpler but the business has become much more complex with my teams we have measured the evolution of complexity in the business it is much more demanding today to attract and retain customers to build advantage on a global scale to create value and the more the business gets complex the more in the name of clarity accountability measurement we multiply structures processes systems you know this drive for clarity and accountability triggers a counterproductive multiplication of interfaces middle offices coordinators that do not only mobilize people and resources but that also add obstacles and the more complicated the organization the more difficult it is to understand what is really happening so we need summaries proxies reports key performance indicators metrics so people put their energy in what can get measured at the expense of cooperation and as performance deteriorates we add even more structure process systems people spend their time in meetings writing reports they have to do undo and redo based on our analysis teams in these organizations spend between 40 and 80 percent of their time wasting their time
but working harder and harder, longer and longer, on less and less value-adding activities. This is what is killing productivity, what makes people suffer at work. Our organizations are wasting human intelligence. They have turned against human efforts. When people don't cooperate, don't blame their mindsets, their mentalities, their personality. Look at the work situations. Is it really in their personal interest to cooperate or not? If when they cooperate, they are individually worse off, why would they cooperate? You know, when we blame personalities, instead of the clarity, the accountability, the measurement, we add injustice to ineffectiveness. We need to create organizations in which it becomes individually useful for people to cooperate. Remove the interfaces, the middle offices, all these complicated coordination structures. Don't, go, don't look for clarity, go for fuzziness. Fuzziness, overlaps. Remove most of the quantitative metrics to assess performance. Speed, the what. Look at cooperation, the how. How did you pass the baton? Did you throw it? Or did you pass it effectively? Am I putting my energy in what can get measured? My legs, my speed, or in passing the baton? You, as leaders, as, as managers, are you making it individually useful for people to cooperate? The future of our organizations our companies, our societies, hinges on your answer to these questions. Thank you. Okay, let's come back and talk about this a little bit. Uh, does everyone, did everyone get generally what he was talking about? If you were to summarize, the reason he used the relay model and he talked about the stats for each runner, so what can be measured on a, on a track, on an oval, is how fast you go from when the gun goes off and you're behind the starting line to when you cross whatever the finish line is. So in a relay, that finish line is a hash mark where you do the handoff area. So in that 100 meters, you can be measured how, fastly, how fast you can run that 100 meters. But his point was that Obviously, you have to be fast, but it's not just about what was measured between the starting line and the handoff line. It was also about the cooperation that ha happened in the handoff area, not just the speed. So you could, what you could say is, you could say, well, I was the fastest runner on the track that day. I ran my 100 meters was measured faster than any other runner that day, but your team still loses because it's not just about each person individually running the fastest, but it's also very much about the handoffs. As a matter of fact, that's what's cost more relay teams uh, gold medals is the handoffs being messed up. And the U.S. has been plagued with bad handoffs, uh, U.S. women's and U.S. men's teams, the last couple of Olympics and world championships. So, all right, so I want to talk about this. Uh, kind of a philosophical question. Um when i want you to think about this so and you can think about being a student or as a worker but when should we focus on being successful at what could be measured and then are there any times where you f don't focus so much on what can be measured but you focus on some other aspect of the job or being a student whatever so um so when is it important to focus on what can be measured? And then what are the times where maybe your focus shouldn't only be on what's what's being measured? I don't know if I'm making that question clear. I'll take volunteers first and then I'll just go around the room. Can you elaborate on that question a little bit? Yeah, so um, let's, let's talk about 
let's say we all worked for a bank and we were all um, tellers, right, at a bank. So there are some things about being a bank teller that can be measured. Um, how long you spend with each customer, um, how quickly you can count down your drawer, you know, count the money out. Um, passing a math test, you know, some kind of, some type of uh, measurement that way. So those are measurable things for people that work at a bank at the teller desk. But then there are some non-measurable things that might actually make you a better bank employee than being the fastest one to count down your drawer, than being the person who spends the least amount of time with each customer, um, than being the one who gets the perfect score on the math test. And so what would those things be? You know, what, what besides all the math and money things could make a bank teller a better bank employee than just the math stuff? So that's, that's kind of what I'm saying. So there are things that have to be measured. If you work at a bank, you do have to know math. You do have to be able to count money. You do have to be able to, you know, move customers through. So, but on the other hand, there are some things that aren't measured that are going to make you a really great bank employee. And so what are those things? So does that help elaborate? Any volunteers? Um, I think something like uh, the amount of care that you show towards the customer, like using the example of the, the bank teller, um, if you're just focused on, on the numbers and you're just trying to move people in and out, you're just trying to get the transaction done, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm a customer going to that bank, if this guy is trying to get me in and out and he doesn't care about the money that I've worked for 20 years to save, you know, and if I'm going to put it in this bank and if he's just trying to get me in and out, I'm not really going to be that inclined to stay here. But if this, if this teller is showing personal care and interest in my life and he, he's like, yeah, I want to protect this. We want to put this in the right place. Um, then, you know, that's going to keep my business as opposed to someone who's just getting me in and out, getting the numbers like, oh, I have the top, I have the most customers today, you know. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Anyone else? You can even think of other work scenarios you've been in, maybe you've worked in a yeah. food industry or a camp or something like that. Jared, go ahead. Um, as far as the bank goes, I'm, I was kind of thinking as far as like uh, the kind of people who um, take the place of um, – uh, for instance, uh, like um, management or training for other employees, I think that's going to make, have a really big effect on it. Because if, uh, honestly, as a boss, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, mood or attitude that you give to other people, it's going to kind of move out throughout the, the people you're working with or trying to train or whatever and it's going to determine whether they want to actually stay at that kind of a place and it's going to really kind of determine uh even go down toward like what max said about uh how people treat other people at the um like customers and if you have if you just got a boss with a really bad mood i guess it, it can really affect even how the employees treat the customers and then that is all going to reflect on the organization or the or the bank itself. Yeah. So what Jared's saying is absolutely true. You can't measure someone's mood with any kind of known scientific measurement, right? It's not like you can get out the mood measurement stick and say, oop, you know, you're at a seven, you're in a, a mild mood, or you're in a three, oh, you're in a bad mood. There's no quantitative measurement. So, um, People can be doing things, their mood, for example, which is kind of a fuzzy term, um, that limit the quality of what's actually happening in the workplace, even though it's not a measurable thing. So that's a good example. Great. And we talked a little bit, I think it was this class, about the difference between qualitative and quantitative. So quantitative is something that can be measured with numbers, with ounces, with pounds, inches, things like that, with speed. Qualitative is more based on qualities, you know, and those are things that are more based on how things feel, 
harder harder to measure. So, but if you've worked, if some of you have worked in um, food places or retail places. What what were some of the things that um, would uh, could happen that were needed to be measured, and then what are some of the things that you had to do that they weren't measured, but you knew that it made a, a difference in the the quality of what was happening there. When I worked in high school, um, we had to sell like, well, we had to try and sell like credit cards. Hey, Emmy, your microphone came disconnected, I think. Can you? Speak again. Talk. Let me. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear okay. you now, just like the Verizon commercial. Okay, when you were in high school, you were selling credit cards. That's where we lost you. <laughs> when I, yeah, when I worked as a at Farm and It happened again. You're, 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 uh, something, something happened. I'm sorry. Oh, wait, it just keeps, maybe it just keeps muting. Something weird. Hold on. No, I can't hear you. And it was probably the best story of the day, honestly. Now I wanted, I wanted to, to hear this awesome story about Emmy selling credit cards. Okay. All right. Wait, I heard a noise. Try one more time, Emmy. Nope. Sorry. Okay. Well, Emmy's out. Okay. So that means someone's got to, you know, take Emmy's place here. It's the, it's the old baton pass. So Alyssa, what was it like to work at, uh, you worked at Chick-fil-A. So there, I'm sure they yeah. me measured certain things, you know, you uh, Mr. Bowen. Yeah. You've cut out now. I, I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Hello. I can hear you. Yeah. No, uh, I think it was, I think it was on my side. It said my internet connection was disabled. That's what, that's what was this is thing. so much fun. I can't <laughs> believe it. It's great. Okay. All right. Alyssa, tell me, tell me about Chick-fil-A. Um, I think there are definitely like the obvious things that they measure, like um, your like counting money back to people or like your service at, at, up at cash or like um, just how you read orders or, you know, stuff like that. Um, how well you can like bag things and like your attitude during that. Um, but I think a lot of it is like based on your attitude. Um, a lot of what they look at, they want people that are truly there to serve other people and that have that desire to um, serve other people and um, just make sure that everybody that comes in there feels like they're having a good day or feels like they're valued in some way. So um, I think that's one of the reasons I really like working there is because they make um, like your pri well, even if you don't necessarily feel that way when you go in, your job is to make people feel valued and like they're important no matter what they're in there for, you know? So even if you really don't like the customer and they're being a jerk, I think that definitely like can look really good for you, I guess, if you're treating them like you care about them and still being kind to them, even if they're not being very nice to you. Um, but also just like from the management side, I think, um, how much time, uh, I know like personally my managers have spent like investing into me when I'm there and um, teaching me things that I didn't know or like showing me, hey, you could be doing this better, but like in a nice way, you know, they're like, hey, maybe do this and try it this way next time or um, just they're, they're there to serve us as well. So they're not just there to make a profit. So yeah. um, I guess with Chick-fil-A, it's definitely like they're there to serve people. And that's the main thing. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. But. It does. So think about just the slight difference even between the marketing of McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. So on many McDonald's signs around the world, um, it says how many billions of burgers are sold every day. Remember that? that they're updating those now, but it says like, you know, over 25 billion served, you know, or whatever. So on the McDonald's side, Chick-fil-A doesn't advertise its numbers. It more has this like sense of cooperation and this feeling that's very 
qualitative instead of quantitative. So I think you guys get the general point that it's definitely, there are measurements that have to be met, but it's the other things that really distinguish yourself. You know, you could be a straight A student and not be a good student. You know, you could learn how to play the game, you know, work the system, get the grades to get yourself the A, but not actually learn anything and not really have a positive college experience, right? So that's true in, in every area of life. So you could have everything that legally you're check marking all the boxes, but you're, you're not really fulfilled. Or as we, you know, you each dealt with different ethical, those big ethical scandals. Most of those ethical scandals started out with people were actually doing the measurables. As a matter of fact, they might have, the measurables might have kind of tempted them into behaving unethically. Hey, if you can get a certain number more home loans approved, then you're helping our company and you'll get paid more. And so it almost promotes, some of those measurements sometimes promote a lack of cooperation, a lack of ethics, a lack of accountability. So. All right, I think you guys get it. Let me, I just want to uh, fly through the last couple um, points real quick on this and then we'll be done discussion. But I want to talk just briefly so it's not the first time you heard about it when you go work somewhere about um, different types of financial accountability that make employees feel really connected. Some companies have gone to this open book management, which is really, I don't know if you ever sit through a church budget meeting and you're like, whoa, this happens once a year and I hear the basic numbers of what's happening in the church and, you know, you kind of vote yes and you move on, but you're not involved in the regular discussions about the finances. Maybe you've worked for a business and you don't know if the company's making money, losing money. You can tell when the owner's stressed out, but that's about it. Open book management is a style of, of leadership where employees feel like even if they don't own stock in the company they're not part owner they know what's going on so they know basically there are some leaders that they're not afraid for their employees to know hey we made a big profit this month or hey we're really struggling this month it's it's not a bad way to do it not everyone likes it um i think it's i think it's pretty smart with some businesses i think open book management's a good idea personally Appreciative inquiry, team-based management technique focuses on strengths rather than dwelling on weaknesses. This is just kind of a term that's out there. Um, discover, dream, design, destiny. This is just ways to get people to contribute based on what they're strong at. So they might have their, their job that they have to get done, but they might also have some really good suggestions for the organization. Daily performance huddles. This is just a way, instead of once a year getting your performance review, you know, like kind of getting your grade card at the end of the semester. This is where you're getting little bits of feedback regularly. It's more work on the manager, but it, it does save a lot of those big, awkward conversations or disciplinary things because you're able to deal with stuff on a daily basis. It's more like being a parent than being a boss. So that's one way. Financial incentives, there's all these different types. Scanlon, this is basically kind of a... Um, a way to it's it's almost can come across as negative where if the team is losing everyone loses a little bit of their bonus um what they do is i believe they pay the bonus up front and then if the company doesn't do well then they take some of that back out later on so it's an in incentive to uh retain your bonus profit sharing this is if, if you work a number of companies do this i think um even high in place like that when you get up into leadership you get to share so if the company does well you get a dividend at the end of the year um and a lot of companies have found that to be very successful stock options and stock purchase uh to be able to have stock of course a company has to be publicly traded some companies if you work for them they will sell you stock in the company at a discounted rate cheaper than what they would sell it to someone that's not an employee and upon like certain uh, anniversaries or things like that, they might give you stock in the company. And if you stay for two years, the stock is worth like 10% when they first give it to you. But if you stay two years, it's worth 100% of the face value of the stock. Stock options and stock purchase, it's great. When I worked for ADP, Fortune 500 company, there were many, many millionaires that made their money from their stock options and stock purchase. Because as the company does well, your investment goes up. 
and it didn't actually cost you anything just with the options the purchase plan you buy them but you're buying them at a much discounted rate so that's a good deal employee stock options which is a little bit of what i just described cooperatives voluntary association of people and meet economic social cultural needs so this is popular in rural agricultural states right you know that there's cooperatives co-ops well there's um rei sporting goods is a co-op uh eastern mountain sports i believe is a co-op so there are a number of places that are co-ops and that's it so uh, that's that's probably enough about that but they're just other ways to engage employees with their company by incentivizing a reason for them to stick around for them to make the company successful so you know it's everyone everyone wants to win no one wants to just you know wither and die so okay i think it's going to wrap it up for this one i will be um updating canvas over the next day or so with some new assignments we're getting down towards the end of the book itself so some of those videos and stuff i think we've got maybe a week left of that and then i might give you a few like micro assignments nothing too huge but something where you can present a little bit with each other so all right any questions okay all right if you need anything just message me i'll see you guys later